Hi, I'm Pastor Ralph Douglas West, pastor of the Church Without Laws, and I'm so excited that you've joined us today. Our heart is to usher lost souls to Christ, empower believers to our spiritual maturity, and I'm thrilled to share that heart with you today through the life-transforming power of the Word of God. I also want to invite you to get a daily encouragement by signing in for my free devotional at ralphdouglaswest.org. Now, let's hear today's message. Be encouraged. A reverent reading of biblical revelation reveals that Jesus is not made glad by the same things that make us glad. We live in a culture of compliments. Our behavior is sometimes motivated to be a recipient of compliments. Equally, we live in a society of position that our value often is determined by the position that we hold. And sometimes our worth and value is determined by how comfortable we can be. These are the things that impress and make us happy. But when you read through the Gospels in particular, you pick up that there were people who tried to compliment Jesus and it didn't work. Sometimes he was referred to as good master or good teacher. And Jesus would say, why call me good? And there were times when others wanted to put him in a lordly position. And Jesus says, I came to be a servant of all. And there were others who thought that if he were the king, then certainly you should be in a palace, in a kingdom. And Jesus responded, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Just a reverent reading of biblical revelation reveals to us that Jesus is not moved by the same things that move us. But there are some things that delight our Lord. One is he's amazed when he finds faith in places where he would least expect it. In one occasion in the Gospel of Mark, he comes through the hometown. He looks for faith. He can't find it. He says that he couldn't do much in that place because of that very reason. And so he was amazed at the lack of faith in the place he thought that he should have found it. And then we read today that he is amazed that he has found faith on the lips of someone that he was least likely to find it. And so with those two tensions, and we live in them, I too would like to do something in life that would really make my Lord glad. And you could, you can do it too. You probably feel the same way. Lord, let my life be of that that it can delight you. Well, this text this morning is tailored to teach us some valuable lessons about the glad Jesus. It opens up with a kind of brief sketch. It may not be biographical, it's just a sketch of an unusual person that demonstrates unlikely faith. In verse 2, it simply says a centurion. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that that sounds like somebody that's standing on the outside and not one that's on the inside. Everything about the centurion is an outsider, religiously, racially, politically, an outsider. Religiously, I mean, he's not a Jew, he's a Gentile, and that puts him on the outside. He has not been reared up on the stories of biblical faith. On the other hand, he's racially on the outside. He's non-Jewish religion, non-Hebrew. 
not a part of the nation of Israel. Politically is on the outside. He works for Herod Antipas, a puppet king, an adversary to God's people. And yet in this brief word and sketch of him and his love for his servant, you discover something unlikely about the person and that is a faith that he possesses. This morning, God has given all of us faith. Martin Luther King Jr. said that faith is taking the step when you don't see the stair. <laughs> if we've not come to that kind of faith yet, keep living, it will happen. Where we take the leap of faith, where we leap out into the dark, not knowing where the net might be. So that's the one thing that you see that Jesus wants us to learn and Luke writes for us is that faith comes from unlikely people, a centurion, an outsider, that there are times where God uses those that are on the outside to teach us lessons about faith. Now there's another side of that lesson though, and that is though God can use whoever he chooses to teach us lessons, may we not exploit avoid, dismiss, overlook all of the things that the Lord has done for us to the point that we forget that we are part of a community of people who worship a faithful God. God is faithful. There's another lesson that we learn here about this centurion. And that is that he teaches us that you can find faith in unlikely places. In verse 2, it describes the soil in which his faith has grown. Such faith for this man has grown in the soil of love for another. He's not cynical about the whole idea. That he loves different objects. It says that he loved his slave. Again, you don't have to be a scholar to pick up that the language itself is bizarre. Here you have a military genius, a giant, someone in position and power, one with all of the achievements and compliments, and now he loves his slave who happens to be sick to the point of death. But he loves him. And then he loves the nation that his slaves comes from. He builds a synagogue. You see that in the next verses? For those of you that don't know, synagogue is the New Testament term before the church was birthed. This is where the Jews would gather together to hear the word read and they would pray the prayers and sing the songs. And then an exhortation from the scroll would be unrolled and they would read from the word. It would be this kind of place that would later become the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it would be safe to say without pressing too hard on the biblical text to fit us this morning that here's a man that built a church for his own enemies. A place where they could worship and find asylum and refuge. Where they could receive their religious, moral, ethical, and spiritual instruction that said something about the man's soul that had been softened. Be careful this morning that you don't become cynical to the ways of God. If faith grows in the soft soil of the heart, it dies in the crusted earth of a cynical mind. I was reading over this and I was thinking about different people in history and the list is too long sermonically to include them but names that you know like a Frederick Nietzsche. One of the men that would be identified as one of the brightest intellectuals of the 20th century. Or someone who would who studied at Basel and one who led the department until he was 44 years old. 
grew up in a Lutheran home. His dad was a Lutheran pastor. And he turned away from God. Died at 44, a year before his death, he had lost his mind. His great parable of life was God is dead and we have killed him. Charles Templeton was a temporary, contemporary of Billy Graham in the heyday of his early years of preaching and Templeton was intellectually brighter and decided he would go to seminary and went to one of the Ivy League seminaries and there at the studied rationalistic thought and Julian Wellhausen documentary of apotheses and debunked all of the spirituality from biblical interpretation. He turned his life away from God. He just died a couple of years ago as a radio announcer over in Canada. You be careful when you start playing with God. Don't become cynical to him. Just because you don't understand the ways of God doesn't mean that God is not mis moving in mysterious ways. And how can our finitesimal mentality, our little teacup of a mind, thimble of a brain, can't take in all of his infant? The infinite in that small little space. Well, this man demonstrated that one can have faith even when you're on the outside. But then he makes the heart of God glad when he sees the humility of faith. It takes humility to love and trust God. I mean, to really believe God, it takes some humility to humble yourself into the presence of God. A delegation came and about 10, 12 people to Jesus to convince Jesus why he needed to go talk to the centurion on behalf of his dying servant. Now, you have to pick this out. So they're informing Jesus that this centurion, and they earnestly seek God, deserves, that's a key word here, deserves you to come and see about his servant. Deserves? Now, I know we're in church and you would not agree, but there are some people who actually believe that they too are entitled to the Lord's coming to their need and rescue. Deserve? Entitlement? Well, Pastor West, you have to understand I pay my tithe. And as a tither, God ought to. Really? But you wouldn't have it if God hadn't given it to you. I'm just saying, deserve. Now, this is not new. That, that's a fancy way of saying Genesis chapter 3 when Satan said to Adam and Eve, what God said in his word is not true. He just knows that once you eat of this, then your eyes will be open. It's always that group of people trying to bring God down. He deserves. That's what they said. But they did come in humility. <coughs> but then there's some insight that we pick up in this story. Jesus goes along with uh, the people that come to get him. And uh, before he gets to the house, friends of the military strategists come out and say, uh, you don't have to come to the house. Speaking on behalf of the centurion, the centurion said, no, that's why I didn't come out to you. Um, I'm not worthy of you coming under my roof. In fact, I'm a man of authority, and I understand authority. And 
if you just speak the word, that's good enough for me. Do you see that this man is making the Lord's heart leap with joy? He said, just speak the word. Remember, he doesn't know Jesus and, and word has come to him about Jesus by hearsay. He's just heard words about what Jesus can do. And now he's saying that that's good enough. I heard words about Jesus and that was enough to convince me. If he just says words in my direction, that'll be enough for my servant. You don't have to come to my house, just say some words. Because he understands something that sometimes we forget and that is that God God's word carries power. There's power in the word of God. Oh, yes, it is. There's power and authority in the word of God. Two, two, two people stand at the altar. They wake up one morning and they are two. They stand at the altar. And that's why when you have these weddings, you ought to tell your bridal parties and you groomsmen, tell them, this ain't no play service. I almost don't like doing weddings for that very reason. Ain't, this ain't no silly time. You are talking about hooking your life up with somebody for the rest of your life. It's made to be full of joy, but not foolishness. And I've gone to some of these weddings, so much stupidity to go on. I, I'm serious. I almost I, and listen. Some of you, you're gonna say, Pastor Wes is really getting older now. I was like this when I was pastoring at 20 years old. The same way. I think that it's some things that are too sacred for you to act silly about. Now that's why you have a reception so you can be as stupid as you want to be. But every church service ought to bring with it an element of reverence and sanctification that we're talking about our life together now. Nobody like to have as much fun as me. I like a good party. That's why I want to invite you to mine because y'all don't like good parties. But when it comes down to church, let church be the church. So two people show up in this sacred moment. You're nervous. You don't know what's going to go on. I've seen groomed and just faint. I tell them, stay down, boy, stay down. <laughs> this is a sacred moment. This is serious. You start talking about, talking about with somebody for the rest of your life? Serious business. So you're standing there, Jones and Smith, you know. Joe Jones, Jane Smith. Then you go through the ceremony, words. Do you take this person? Do you take this person? Then you get to these critical words. Do, do you promise to love them? Honor them? You know, respect them? And let me tell you something, and these are real words, in sickness and in health. There's some real words. I have friends now that I intercede for on regular basis that are living that in sickness and in health and richer for poor. That is having, I'm living with other people where I'm praying for them, where they've had it, not enough. This thing is real. And then, and then you say, I do. And then you say, we're going to seal this with a ring. With this ring, I pledge my love and life to you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, and that's a binding. But you still ain't married yet. Not in the eyes of the law. And, and you go through that. And then, then the preacher says, by the power invested in me, as an ordained minister of the church, recognized by the state of Texas, I now hereby pronounce you husband and wife and what God has joined together let no one separate you walked in Smith and Jones but now you're walking out as one there's power in the word 
Not just power in ceremonial word, but there's power in worship word that there are times where you'll walk in this door. And let me tell you something, how life works. A lot of times you'll come in here, you don't really want to be here. You, you think you're doing your husband a favor, your wife a favor, your mama and daddy a favor. But keep living the day of come when you come here for yourself. And you'll say, I need a word from the Lord. All of a sudden, things ain't so funny no more when you need a word from God. And God is gracious enough to give you the word that you need. <laughs> Preach, Pastor West. <laughs> Say the word. <laughs> My servant will be here. I'm a man of authority. I live under authority. I know what authority means. Power of the word. I know what authority means. I, listen, I wear the regalia of a person of authority. I say go, they go, and come, they come. Do this, they do that. I know what authority is. You know what authority is. Driving down the street, whoop, 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 whoop. You just pull over. Because <laughs> you know what authority is. <laughs> now imagine, my pastor used to say this, imagine that you pull over and the officer get out and say, pull over, I'm the police. He said, that's the very note to know that they are not in authority. The fact that you pulled over says you recognize what authority is. This man said, I know what authority is. And Jesus at this point turns around and he's on his way back. I'm done. Because the Lord, when he gives you what you need, he always gives you more than what you need. He'll reward your faith. He does. He, he'll, he'll give you what you need and always gives you more than what you need. And so Jesus heads back. And there are a couple of lessons in that. <laughs> Jesus said, my goodness, I've not seen this kind of faith when I went to the church without walls. <laughs> I, I've been looking for it and I hadn't seen this kind of faith. And it made him glad that he saw this kind of faith. And by the word, by the way, he didn't even say a word. He didn't say, Lord, heal the man by my power and authority. He didn't say anything. He just turned around and went back where he was going. He just said, I've never seen nothing like that. The man didn't see Jesus. Jesus didn't see the man. Jesus didn't see the sick servant. The sick servant didn't see uh, the saving Lord. They just turned around and said, boy, you got a lot of faith. As far as Jesus was concerned, once he saw the faith, that took care of all the rest. He didn't need to see anybody else. Faith was enough for him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It's impossible to please God without faith. But those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith can move mountains. I'm done with the sermon. That's, that, that, that's it. Jesus said, I had never seen nothing like this. So I don't have to go to no house. I don't have to go anywhere else. I've, I've seen enough. I have experienced enough in the fact of seeing their faith. Now, this story really means a lot to you and I now, doesn't it? Because the people involved didn't see each other. All they had was the demonstration of faith. You and I have never seen Jesus. It takes faith to love God. Stop trying to act like it does not. It takes faith to do everything involved in what God has called us to do. You are asked to believe in a God that you've never seen. Trust in a Jesus that you've never laid eyes on. Be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's more than just how you feel. 
That's a lot of faith. You're asked to follow Christ in places that you have never gone. Takes faith. To give financial resources for the Lord's ministry on the earth and also to prove that you will detach yourself from anything that comes between you and the Savior. It takes faith to do that. That's the reason why so many people never make Jesus glad. They do follow Jesus rationally as long as it makes sense. As long as they can compute it, as long as they can make facticity of it, as long as they're able to look at the, the, the arithmetic of it, then, then I follow God. There are people in this room will tell you that works up to a point. There comes a moment where you really have to follow Jesus and you began walking by faith and not by sight. You'll begin believing even when you don't see it. To believe even when you don't see it. Trust the word. Trust the power of God's word and let God do for you more than what you ask for. All they ask for is that the servant be healed. That's all. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you a bonus. I'm going to give you a bonus. I'm going to make you whole. The Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at our heart. So if you want to experience dynamic growth as a follower of Jesus, you've got to change from the inside out. I'd like to help you experience a powerful inner transformation by sending you my CD series, The Big Fisherman, as a thanks for your financial gift to encourage more people with the power of God's Word. So call now or go online to give and request your copy. Be encouraged.